On to the next. We're ready to talk about uh, rhetoric in the New Testament. Now in the Old Testament we see the uh, progress as man really imitated the rhetoric of God. God speaks to us a certain way. He persuades us with his authority. Um, he gives commands, but then also um, he incentivizes those commands with promises and blessings. Um, and he gives us tokens, visible um, signs for verbal promises. In the New Testament, we see a continued advancement. And in fact, as civilization, as mankind advanced in our understanding of rhetoric, uh, we see a similar advancement in the rhetoric of the men of Scripture. Now, we're going as we look at the rhetoric of the New Testament, we, of course, have to start with the rhetoric of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a rhetorician, a user of rhetoric. A rhetorician is a student of rhetoric. A red, I'm sorry, a rhetorician is a student of rhetoric. A rhetor is a user of rhetoric. So, Jesus Christ was a, a redder. He, he persuaded, he spoke, he spoke clearly and effectively, powerfully, in fact. And so, as we look at the New Testament, we're going to look particularly at the rhetoric of Jesus Christ, and then at the followers of Jesus Christ, particularly the Apostle Paul. And as we look at these, we're going to relate what they were doing. We're, we're, we're going to give some historical con context for it. The place for us to begin in, in looking at the rhetoric of Jesus Christ is um, an incident that happened in Nazareth when Jesus went to the synagogue there and spoke. There was, for the service in the synagogue, a prescribed order now you can follow along with me in Luke chapter 4 as I speak. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 is where we'll be looking. But for the, um, for the synagogue, there was a prescribed order of service. And that, pres that prescribed order of service was followed. In fact, we see, we learn what that prescribed order was from what Jesus did. The order for a Jewish Sabbath service was first scripture reading, then interpretation, followed by exhortation. By the way, that's a great way to arrange a sermon as well. Um, scripture reading, the passage of scripture, interpretation, explaining what it means, and then exhortation, or applying it and exhorting the church to follow what the Bible is saying there. That's what Jesus did in Luke chapter 4. Notice what the passage says. Luke 4, 16, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the, the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eli Eliasius the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, save Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up 
and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong, but he passing through the midst of them went his way. Now we see there that Jesus followed the order, and, and really this is what I want to point out to you. Uh, what Jesus was doing here, he's following the order that was prescribed for him. So it, it's not, in rhetoric, we're going to require a certain order of um, things, and we're going to require you to put certain things into all of your writing, um, a certain um, parts of discourse, if we call it that. That's what we will be calling it, the parts of discourse. We see that Jesus also had, there was, a, there was already a set pattern, and he followed that pattern. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, we see Jesus stepping away a little bit more from what ha the formality of the synagogue and arranging his discourse according to the parts of discourse that are common uh, and commonly used in rhetoric. Now, later on, we'll be teaching you the parts of discourse, so you don't need to try to remember all this at this point. I just want you to know that there are parts of discourse um, and a certain arrangement or order um, in which you put different parts of your speech. And we see Jesus following that. Now, you should understand, Aristotle lived about 350 years before Jesus Christ was born. So, uh, rhetoric was pretty well developed in the Greek world, and of course, the Greek world heavily influenced the world in Christ's time. So it should not surprise us that in Christ's work, in his preaching and so on, that he would follow um, the, the way of discourse, the parts of discourse that were commonly used by teachers in his day. The Apostle Paul, who sat at the feet of Gamaliel and learned, um, was well studied and, and knew very well uh, both Jewish history, but also uh, Greek culture. He was very familiar with it. He himself used the parts of discourse, the approach to rhetoric that was established by uh, Aristotle, Quintilian, and the other um, rhetorician or, or, or significant figures in the development of the study of rhetoric. So, so what I'm saying here is that both Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul, who are the two key spokespeople in the Word of God in the New Testament, both of them followed what was developed in rhetoric. Now, there are reasons for that. One thing that you should understand is that rhetoric is not something that you have to study in order to use. In fact, in rhetoric, we are studying how effective communicators speak and reason and persuade. So, we're not studying some kind of special technique here. We're studying what effective speakers do. That's really the bottom line. And you're going to learn that even people who never studied Aristotle, never studied rhetoric at all, if they speak clearly and effectively, they are following these guidelines, these principles that are laid out for us. Um, so, I want you to understand that. Now, Let's consider the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not going to read the whole Sermon on the Mount. It would, you can read it. You have your Bible, um, hopefully by this time. But what we notice in Matthew chapter 5, in verse, beginning in verse 3, where the Sermon on the Mount begins, we see that Christ divided his sermon following the parts of discourse, which we'll be learning later on in class. Here, let me just give you a sketch of his order. His introduction is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. We know that as the Beatitudes. His division, where he outlines the thesis and the parts of his um, speech, are laid out for us beginning in verse 13 down through verse 20. The main body of his work is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, through Matthew chapter 7, and verse 23. 
And then the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 29. Now those, that is four of the six parts of discourse. In the parts of discourse, we're going to add a couple things. We're going to have the introduction. We're going to have a statement of facts. We're going to have a division, which is where the thesis, the main thesis of the speech is found. Then we're going to divide the body or the proofs between the confirmation and the refutation. The confirmation, positive arguments, the refutation, refuting the objections, answering objections. And then, of course, ending with the conclusion. That's the six parts of discourse, and Christ pretty much follows that in his, um, in his Sermon on the Mount. He also uses, in his teaching and in his interaction with people, Jesus used dilemma. Now, dilemma is where you take two choices, both of which are uncomfortable, and you use that to force someone to take an opinion um, that they don't want to take or to admit to something they don't want to admit to. Maybe I should say it that way. Now, there's an example of this in Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. I want you to look there and follow with me. Luke chapter 6, verse 6. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts, and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he rose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, Now here's the dilemma. This is what Jesus said. I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? All right, there's their dilemma. Now, Jesus did this pretty regularly. He did it, for instance, when the woman caught in adultery was brought to him. He presented them with two choices, neither of which they were comfortable with. But those choices were required or they, they demanded of the people that, they, that he was dealing with that they be honest in their answer. Lay aside your prejudice here. You're going to have to face this. Jesus also used paradox. Now, paradox is something that on the surface at first glance seems self-contradictory. But then when you look at it, you see that no, it's true. This is a par an example of a paradox Christ used. The last shall be first. How can that be? Well, it's a paradox. It's it seems self-contradictory, but when you further examine it, you see that, no, it's only apparently contradictory. He said this, Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Jesus also used metaphor. I am the door of the sheep, he said. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He used simile. He told the disciples, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. And he also said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. That's simile. So we see Jesus also using poetic devices as part of his teaching, as part of his persuading. The last for us to consider is the Apostle Paul. And for that, I'm going to um, want you to look at Acts chapter 13, verse 16 through 41. Acts 13 Verse 16 through 41 gives us the first of two recorded sermons of the Apostle Paul. Now, I believe that these sermons, this is not word for word what the Apostle Paul said, but rather a summary of his message. But nonetheless, it gives us an outline of Paul's approach to preaching. And it's interesting the way Paul approached this. In Acts 13, we have a sermon for the Jews. And I want you to notice the six parts of discourse. And again, if I can review what those are, you have the introduction, the statement of facts, the thesis or, or the division, the proofs, which divide into positive proofs and negative proofs. So that's two parts of discourse. And then the conclusion. There's your six parts. In verse 16 of Acts 13, Paul gives the introduction. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. 
Beginning in verse 17, he gives the statement of facts, the background to what he's going to argue. Verse 17, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelled as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of four hundred and fifty years, until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul the son of Kis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, so whom also, to whom also he gave testimony, and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled that was spoke written of him, they took, a, took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people." Now there are the statement of facts, the background material, and from that background material, the Apostle Paul is going to make his arguments. His thesis is in verse 32 and 33. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now there's... There's a thesis. This is, this is his main argument, and now he's going to offer some proof. Verse 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, and was laid unto his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. So there he's arguing. He's arguing for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That was, the, that was Paul's emphasis when dealing with the Israelites. And then he concludes in verse 38, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore, lest thou come upon you, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold ye despisers, and wonder, and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Now, there's a second example of Paul's rhetoric. Here, this passage, a specifically Jewish audience, and he goes through his background material, is all the, the Old Testament history of Israel summarized. No doubt he greatly elaborated on that leading up to the life of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection from the dead. And he concludes by calling them to repentance. Now, I want you to notice the difference when he stood before a Greek audience. The Greeks, schooled in the um, rhetoric of Aristotle, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 22. Would you look at Acts chapter 17? And verse 22.
Here, Paul in Acts 17 gives um, a, a, a discourse, an, an argument, as, as a sermon, which is what that is. He gives it to a particularly Greek audience, and I want you to notice the difference. In verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. There's Paul's introduction. And now he jumps straight to the thesis. In verse 23, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. He's standing in front of a hostile audience. He doesn't take a long time with background material and so on. He points to that tomb, to the unknown God, and he says, the the God you ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. And all the rest is proof. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto silver, gold, or silver, or stone, graven by art or man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. It's interesting, too, that the Apostle Paul here also emphasizes the resurrection of Christ. Uh, just a side note, rabbit trail for a moment. Uh, the Apostle Paul and the New Testament never looks at the resurrection as an event to be proven. The Bible doesn't treat the resurrection as something that needed proof. Rather, the Bible treats the resurrection as proof. It is proof of the truth of Christianity. That's what Paul pointed at as the proof for what he was saying. But we're talking rhetoric here, not Bible. Um, so I want you to notice the way the Apostle Paul tailors his message for a Greek audience. That's another principle of rhetoric that you're going to learn this year, is to consider your audience. What arguments will work? What arguments will not work? Our first day, we discussed definition of rhetoric. Aristotle defined it as uh, the, the, the faculty of observing in any given case the available means of persuasion. In other words, observing and recognizing what arguments will be effective with this audience, given who I am, given what the case is, given the audience I'm speaking to, Finding what, fa what arguments will give me the best chance of persuading my audience. Now, I take you through the Word of God really to show you that as Christians, we have a clear warrant for using rhetoric. In next week's reading, you're going to go on kind of a journey of discovering and understanding what the objections are to rhetoric, um, how we should approach those objections um, and whether they're legitimate objections or not so that we can have a Christian understanding of rhetoric. We, everything that we do, we do as Christians. We don't, get a, we, we don't have the opportunity and really we wouldn't want to lay aside our Christianity in anything that we do and least of all not in our use of words. We want the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart to be acceptable in God's sight. And so, as we've looked through the Bible, I hope that you're encouraged at least that there is a legitimate use of rhetoric for a Christian. Thank you.